I'm interested in legibility and impact. And I think a way to sort of get my point across more quickly is to sort of leverage all of these design and art skills that I have to show people what I'm talking about. So some people are like, tell us, don't show us. I'm like, no, I'm just going to show you. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast, where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome everyone to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today we're talking with Caroline Sinders. Caroline is a machine learning design researcher and artist. For the past few years, she's been examining the intersections of technology's impact on society, interface design, artificial intelligence, abuse, and politics in digital conversational spaces. Sinders is the founder of Convocation Design and Research, an agency focused on the intersections of machine learning, user research, designing for public good, and solving difficult communication problems. As a designer and researcher, she has worked with Amnesty International, Intel, IBM Watson, the Wikimedia Foundation, and others. Caroline holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Master's of Professional Studies from New York University. Thanks, Caroline, for being on the program today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Well, I took a look at your website, obviously, and saw some of the awesome projects you've been working on. But I'd be curious to see, I mean, normally what I ask people first question is, is sort of, how did you get into this space? And maybe what's some of the background that led you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. My background is kind of well, for me, it looks like a much more straighter line, I guess, to other people. It's quite wobbly because my undergrad degree was in photography and imaging, and I focused a lot on photojournalism and portraiture. But I was really interested in the future of imaging and how technology was going to affect photographers and what it meant to take a photograph. And like, how would, at the time I was an undergrad, this was the early aughts, so thinking about how cell phone cameras were, were revolutionizing photography. But I was interested in like, well, what is, what are more future thoughts? Like how will technology affect what an image means? Like is a photograph a photograph if it's ever printed? If the literal meaning of the word photograph is thinking about sort of light onto paper, for example. So how do we think about authorship in a space of like digital imaging? So those are a lot of the things I was really interested in. You know, after graduating, working for a few years, I went and got a master's at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. And what I was also interested in there was thinking about how do you build tools for communities? And I was still really interested in photographers. And what really got me interested in machine learning or artificial intelligence is I got a job at IBM Watson working on natural language processing APIs as a design researcher. And so as a design researcher, I sat in a space between the design team and the research team. So while I was on the product design team, my goal often was to interface with research scientists or engineers or like different heads of companies. If, if we bought a product, for example, or we bought a company and then had to sort of integrate that software into our company. And one of the things I had liked a lot about my master's program, and I realized what I actually really liked at IBM is I really like taking technicalities and translating them into different kinds of understandable entry points. So that could be how do you streamline documentation or how do you build a demo to explain what something is doing? Sometimes I describe myself as not a deeply technical person, but I'm trying to not say that one because it's imposter syndrome and two, it's not a good way to describe yourself if you're like a woman in technology. But um, this is more to say that like, I really like programming in terms of understanding how and why people program and how they make the things they make. And I'm less interested in myself in terms of writing code, but I'm very interested in technical processes. And so because I find those things interesting, I really loved having this role where I got to really learn about all different kinds of software and machine learning capabilities that we had inside of Watson. And then working with the design team to make these public facing entry points for different kinds of communities. So how do we think about documentation on Bluemix, for example, was a thing I had to really think about. We really had to build demos, which I enjoyed doing, and I think all of us did, to really help sort of sell what this thing was that we had, right? A demo is a very normal thing, if you think about it, to see on a website that a company has about like a software library, 
for example. You want to build a demo to kind of show people what it does really well. Part of what I had to figure out is, well, what does it do well? What doesn't it do well? And then how do we also make sure when we're bringing over new pieces of software or if we're launching new kinds of software from our own research lab, that it fit into the sort of product eco landscape we had, like Bluemix, like the documentation has to sound the same. So I just really liked that. To me, it was very interesting puzzles to kind of try to solve and, and unpack. But it also really fit into these things I found interesting earlier, which is, well, what is the future of any kind of creative space? So thinking beyond photography, like what's the future of language? That's what I found extraordinarily interesting about working in natural language processing. Wow. Lots to unpack there. Wow. Lots of different thoughts. And I thought it was interesting how you kind of went from photos to sentence structure. I mean, it feels like, right, you said your background was in photography. And and I was, I, I was thinking about Photoshop. And I mean, I was tinkering with Photoshop back in the 90s and thinking about all these cool things that you could do with it. Not even AI, you know, related, but just like, wow, just the power that you can do now that you can control these images. But, you know, what, what do you think then made you think, get away from visual more into sentence structure and, and words? I mean, I guess the very easy answer is that's where I was placed when I got hired at, at IBM. But those were, those were some of the more things you're working on. But I've always been interested in conversation and sort of the really messy parts of humanity, which ends up being any kind of social interaction. And online, the majority of our social interactions are the written word. It's text. It's maybe less a video. So if we're thinking of any kind of conversational space on the web, we're engaging more with text than we are with audio, video, or images. We, we may be like adding GIFs, but the the main sort of conversation we have is one could argue primarily text-based. So for me, one of the things I was interested in looking at was communities and conversation, and that becomes um, any kind of text-based interface. And that was what I, what I got interested in at IBM, or sorry, not at IBM, but at ITP. ITP is the acronym for my master's program. I was also really interested in political uses of social media and how people were sort of using and misusing tools in like good, bad, neutral, delightful, weird ways. And that was one of the classes I took at ITP was with Clay Shirky on sort of how people were using social media in these sort of new ways. So I was just really interested in how people sort of augment tools around them and what is a tool really? I mean, how does that sort of facilitate or add friction to any kind of human connection? And then within that, how different aspects of human communication really become data. And so I was just super interested in conversation. Actually, I should go back and say earlier, one of the reasons why I was probably put into text, I'm now remembering uh, a conversation I had with the head of design, was I was really interested in, in human conversation. And that was one of the things I said. Was I was really interested. I'm interested in how people talk to each other. I'm interested in like where machine learning is going to fit into that sort of engagement. And I also think at the time, Watson hadn't really done a lot of computer vision. And I think that was also something that like even at school, we weren't really playing around with very much. But I at the time just, I and I still am very deeply interested in how people talk to each other and how technology becomes sort of a medium or conduit for that kind of communication. And then one of the things I got really interested at Watson that I'm still interested in is why do we design conversational tools that mimic human conversation? And what can we think of more as conversation, like I call it bot-tiness. So like the way that bots converse, why do we not create new interfaces that can sort of do things that mimic the strengths of machine learning like data processing? So why are we trying to continually fit interactions in this very humanistic mold, which is one-to-one of, of like a two-person conversation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so as you have been talking through your career and things that you have done, I do think it's, it's really cool that, you know, a lot of people think of this space and you touched on it a little bit, the AI machine learning thing, like everyone has to have a PhD, right? Or everyone has to be a data scientist or they need to be like very, very technical. But I think, you know, you've been able to, to really thrive. And I would say, you know, do some really awesome projects, do some beautiful things here, looking at it more from a humanistic standpoint, right, from the outside. And when you talked about actually creating demos, it reminded me of a job that I had back in the late 90s, which was with a company that was doing mapping technology. And this was before everybody, the, the big GIS, you know, boom happened. 
But, you know, we had a piece of software and, it, and imagine, you know, Google Maps before Google Maps. I mean, we were really doing some really cool stuff with this. And I was tasked with essentially putting together developer samples. So, uh, you know, as an engineer, what are some things that I could do with it? Because a lot of people, as an engineer, you see the building blocks, but you don't see like what you can actually make, you know, at the end of the day. And so I, I think it's, it's really, really cool that you've been able to, you know, when you were working at IBM, for example, just to sort of like be able to say, hey, here's what's possible. It sounded like that was probably a, a, a pretty, pretty fun space to live in. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I mean, and it's something where I think one of the perhaps the through lines of my work is that I just want to know a lot. And so for me, part of the appeal of technology is I want to know as much about it as possible. And then I think probably for me, I don't know if this is a strength. For me, I don't necessarily have to be good at programming to know a lot about it. So like I'm very interested in like learning about the communities of people that engage with technology, how and why they use what they use, why do they select the tools that that they select? What do they then make out of those tools and why? And would they have used a tool at a different time? I should say that like I do know how to program and I do know how to do like some of these like, you know, more computer science based work. But for me, it's less interesting to like learn a new programming language. It's more interesting to understand what that programming language does and what's the community like behind it and who are they and how do they interact. And I think that interest, which is, you know, one could argue a much more like ethnographic or like anthropological interest has served me really well as a user researcher and design researcher because it's given me a skill set to, I think, be a, a stronger like product thinker because I am deeply interested in why people use things. And then conversely, I find technology interesting. So I want to know as much about it as possible. So I also then am like a more technical design researcher since there's like an understanding or a background I try to build up in myself when I work in a new domain. So I really want to know everything about that area. So a lot of what I would do at IBM, even in my free time is I would make all the research scientists talk to me and get coffees with me and really sort of walk through, like, I really wanted to know, like, why does this one thing perform better in this way? And like, was that the intention? And how did you make it? And why? And it wasn't just to help also serve the product. It was like, I am just intrinsically interested in those things. Absolutely. And we'll put links to your website and stuff like that in the liner notes for this podcast, because you've got a ton of projects out there. And I definitely want you to talk, speak to some of your um, favorite ones. But you mentioned about the way bots converse. I mean, are, are, are you getting a lot into Alexa and, and OK Google and Siri, the, like those types of things? Or are those spaces that you're doing a lot of research and discovery in today? Or, or what's, what's sort of the sort of on your mind today? Today is like a bunch of different things. I'm coming back to the bot stuff a lot more, especially more in, into my artwork. And I'm hoping to do more work on that. So if anyone is, is interested, we know, love to like collaborate. A lot of the work I do sort of spans like a few different areas, again, all through the lens of looking at technologies and society. And then like a particular lens I take is like consumer safety. So I'm thinking a lot about consumer products. So right now I'm a, I'm a part-time researcher at the ICO here in the United Kingdom. So that's the Information Commissioner's Office. And that's like the UK's version of the FTC. And what I'm looking at there is, are there dark patterns in artificial intelligence products? And so the role that the ICO takes is, is they look a lot at personal data and personal data laws that exist here in the United Kingdom. And then they're, they're looking deeply at technology. So I sit on the tech policy team, the tech strategy team. And so a lot of the things that we're, we're producing are like guides for companies on like, how do you think about technology privacy in terms of AI or uh, trying to break down like what auditing means and what are different ways people can do that. So if, if you're not working in AI or machine learning, at least trying to explain what these things mean or trying to give a primer on like, what is, what is the role of responsible AI? And like, what does that mean? And so what I'm looking at is this sort of area that has existed in design for many years called dark patterns. Dark patterns are design patterns that unintentionally or intentionally manipulate users into making decisions they wouldn't normally make. So if you've ever subscribed to an email listserv and then tried to unsubscribe, and like two weeks later, you're still subscribed, you probably encountered a dark pattern. The reason I'm interested in dark patterns 
related to artificial intelligence comes from a point raised by the FTC. So back in April 2021, the FTC was holding a a day-long convening with a lot of different experts about the role of dark patterns. And one of the points they raised that they were interested in is, are there dark patterns in artificial intelligence? And what I'm sort of seeking to do over the next two years with my research is trying to establish, are there, are there dark patterns related to artificial intelligence products and what would they be? And I am sort of coming in with a little bit of skepticism, which I think is always healthy because I'm not sure if there are dark patterns. And one of the things in, in AI, I do think that there are dark patterns. But one of the reasons I have this sort of skepticism is, you know, I'm also interested in where does like a dark pattern stop and just like really bad or pardon my language, like really shitty design start. You know, you sometimes maybe encounter a product and you're like, this product isn't really made very well. And it wasn't made not well on purpose. It just is not made very well, right? Like maybe like the buttons don't quite make sense or, you know, it was clearly made on a very small shoestring budget. And now like one of the things I like to think of is it's like really early Zoom in the middle of the pandemic was not made for that many people on the pandemic. There was a lot of bad design choices, right, in Zoom. Those choices have now been updated to be better choices, but that wasn't necessarily a dark pattern, though there, there could have been some on there, right? So I'm interested in, in thinking of what are the edges of dark patterns? And so the reason I'm also interested in are there dark patterns or not in AI is often artificial intelligence, I think, when embedded inside of consumer products, you know, we think of dark patterns as like a, a UI choice. I am curious as if some of the quote unquote dark patterns we'd see arising are actually sort of downstream harms of an algorithmic harm or like algorithmic bias. So meaning it's not necessarily the way we traditionally think of a dark pattern. It's actually the manifestation of a harm. And so I feel like I'm being a little nebulous, but a better way to think about this is like Princeton did a big study on a bunch of e-commerce websites and they were looking for dark patterns and they found like a bunch over a thousand websites. So why are there dark patterns there? Well, like the upstream harm is capitalism. There are dark patterns on e-commerce sites because they want you to buy stuff, right? And so then that's like an effect, you know, but if we think of, well, what does artificial intelligence do inside of a consumer product? So maybe it's different kinds of like search engines, right? So the results you're seeing, if there is technically a dark pattern in there, is it the way we think of a dark pattern or is it actually the harm, right? Is it sort of the like opacity we have related to why we're seeing these results or like, or a model that's been like mistrained. And so what I'm sort of striving to do is, is trying to say like, should we call those, those harms dark patterns when we see them arising in something, let's say like algorithmic pricing on inside of Amazon, you know, I don't know. I think this happened in the US, but you know, where like hand sanitizer during the pandemic got really expensive. Should we call that a dark pattern or should it actually be named something else because it's directly correlated to algorithmic pricing and algorithmic search, right? So it seems like a very niche thing to be focusing on, but because it's such an emerging field, I think it's important we name these things correctly as the research is emerging. How does this overlap with, you know, everyone's talking about AI and ethics these days and specifically around bias, right? So, you know, these models have been trained and, and oftentimes they're trained on old data that has already got biases in it. So now the results you're getting are even more biased and, you know, it could be related to race, it could be related to sex, religion, whatever it is. Does the thing you're talking about with regards, you know, to dark patterns overlap in in some of that case? That's actually kind of what I'm, I'm trying to sort of figure out because I would argue that they do. And in doing this research, I want to see actually how closely correlated they are because my my hunch is, is that they're actually the same thing. Like that a dark pattern in artificial intelligence, not in any other product, but a dark pattern inside of products that have AI. And then if we see a dark pattern that comes out of something related to machine learning or algorithms or AI, is that harm? And maybe we shouldn't call it a dark pattern because that leads to confusion. So my hunch is that with this kind of, again, like algorithmic pricing, or certain algorithmic search engines in like e-commerce platforms, aka Amazon, that like the surfacing of that material, maybe we can't call it a dark pattern, or if we do, we have to be very specific about it, but it is directly related 
to this research of, of harm and bias. And so I think what I'm interested in is, is how do we either add more specificity to it? Because I think we're at these different in- inflection points of, you know, so many things are harms. And it's important that we name harm for what it is. But I also think it's important to then understand what kind of harm is it or where directly does it fall in terms of like policy when we're naming that harm, if we're thinking of prevention and solutions and mitigation. So I think I'm interested in how do we start to add more specificity to this sort of landscape, one, to help people better understand what these things are. And then in turn, that helps us either course correct, either by writing better regulation and better policy or improving the technology. I think it's probably a mixture of of both of those. But I think it's important now that we start to add, again, particular names to the kinds of harm that we're seeing. So if it is algorithmic harm, which it is, right, then like, is there a subset of, do we have subsets of names now that we sort of call? So that's one of the things I'm really interested in trying to sort of decipher. Because earlier in research that I did in 2019, I was calling like this kind of algorithmic sort of pricing or at least like the surfacing of products inside of e-commerce platforms that we could think of that as a dark pattern. One, because we don't know why why we're seeing that. And so we don't really have, as a consumer, we can't really compare it to like a variety of other products. Like if we think of Amazon as like a store, which it is, right? A traditional target, they can price things at different points. They can place them in different parts of the physical store. We do that all the time. It's a form of persuasive design. That's totally fine. It's not illegal, right? And it shouldn't be like people, you know, why not play around, see see what people will buy. What's different with Amazon is that it's like being in a target of like 11,000 rows and all the rows are kind of like moving around you as you grab a product. So there's no way for you to necessarily have a totally clear understanding of choice in that space. And so like in, in an e-commerce setting, like, should we still call it a dark pattern? That's something I'm now wondering like a few years later, like, or should we call it a subset of a certain kind of algorithmic like manipulation in an e-commerce setting, right? Just talking about money in that aspect. Because like, can you realistically make an informed decision then as a consumer in that particular product, if there's no really clear way for you to actually like very evenly compare, right? all the different products is you could hit refresh and be given a different thing, or or you could change your address slightly, maybe by a state and see something totally different, even if all those products are still technically available to you. These are like the rabbit holes I'm like going down like right now. (laughs) We call it. What is it? Ah. Wait, is it as simple as clickbait? I mean, that's the thing that I'm thinking of. Like when I when I go to read an article, then at the bottom this it's just like it's, you know, some some startling picture with some you know, freaky tagline that just tries you to click it, right? It's just, and uh, again, I continue just to walk away from those things, but, you know, people get sucked into that. It's it's just really all about trying to get more clicks in some ways. Right. But I think even so, like, clickbait also then is a different term, right? Because we're talking about that in the context of articles. And so then maybe that's something different, right? So maybe we have algorithmic harms specifically with names for clickbait. And, and, and maybe it's too much, like, you know, it is turtles all the way down, but I don't know. I do think it is important to try to like name some of these things also just in terms of, you know, so we're all on the same page regardless of technical background. So we know what it is we're talking about. Sure. Common vocabulary. Absolutely. That people know what they mean. You know, you mentioned harm and and I was looking at a project. I'm not sure if this was the most recent project, but there was this remote work report that you did. It was about COVID-19 sort of exacerbating harm. I thought it was really neat. And I, again, like I say, I'll, I'll put a link to some of these projects. But, you know, I, I don't know if you want to talk about that one in particular, if that one's like more recent. But I would be curious to know, like, what are some projects you've worked on and and maybe what was your favorite and maybe why? Yeah, well, it's hard to say a favorite. Uh, I feel like that's almost like choosing a favorite child. Even though I don't have any children, but my mom has told me that she can't pick a favorite between me and my sister. So I'll believe that that's impossible. I mean, I have quite a few, like I, I really enjoyed working on that report you're mentioning. I worked on two projects specifically. Actually, now I've worked on three projects specifically about COVID-19. So one was early on in the pandemic with funding from a Midiar network to look at how creative communities were responding to the pandemic. And then what, what were like findings that community organizers, designers, and, and engineers 
would need in terms of like designing products for communities. Then I worked on the remote workplace harassment report, which I was really excited to work on with a variety of people with McKinsey Mac and, and Ellen Powell and Yang Hung. And, you know, that was sort of really sort of asking this question of we've seen online harassment, obviously in all different forms of digital spaces. We know there's workplace harassment. What does remote workplaces look like and what is happening right now with harassment in those now digitized workspaces? And I'm really, really, you know, really proud of the work we did because I think we set a pretty good baseline in terms of, of looking at the pandemic at that time and also sort of understanding all the different kinds of harms and frictions people were facing. Like one of the things we were surprised, but not shocked to hear, but just surprised that really validated things we'd been hearing was that like across the board, regardless of seniority level, everyone was feeling burnt out. And I feel like that's one thing to just sort of say, but to have the data on that because we had 3,000 survey respondents was sort of really powerful to think about. Another project I worked on with funding from the Sloan Foundation was looking at academic communities and remote convenings and, and what do they need and sort of what's the future around that. So again, leveraging a lot of best practices and a lot of people are really interested in hybrid and there isn't a lot of good research out in how to do hybrid. And so that was an interesting finding to have I really enjoyed a project that I did before the pandemic with funding from Sloan and the Ford Foundation, which it's a part of their critical digital infrastructure research. And so I was looking at JavaScript communities and a specific subset of JavaScript communities called the JS comps and the JS meetups and how there seemed to be a lot of diversity and equity and inclusion in those spaces. And why did that happen? And, you know, again, like what are best practices they have if we think of community health as a necessary part of open source communities and open source infrastructure? And so that was also one I was really proud of. And I think that that, again, harkens back to a lot of my original interest, especially when I was joining IBM of, I find technical communities really interesting. And, you know, I have a skill set inside of a technical space that maybe other people don't, which again is this form of user research and design research. And so I just find communities really interesting, particularly technical ones and how they engage with each other and how they talk to each other. And then how do we think of these communities also in very much blended spaces in the sense of that they're existing online, obviously, in digitized communities, be it through, you know, contributing to different code on GitHub or on Reddit, Stack Overflow, Slack, or Twitter. And then in some cases, at least with the JS comps, physically meeting up and sort of being in that space together and, you know, sort of acknowledging that for a lot of technical communities, the offline meetings are incredibly important. And that's one of the forms that sort of furthers community. But these spaces can still be really strife with toxicity. So how do we think of community health and community norms as a form of like infrastructure we need to invest in as a form of technology in a way that we have to invest in? And so this is this is the kind of work I really like to do. Yeah, that's cool. Well, you're talking to a big community person. If anybody follows me, I mean, I've, I I really am passionate about building technology communities. Kind of started back in the early days of mobile and formed a community called Mobile Twin Cities, and did a lot of you know, kind of the whole idea was to bring together people who were building mobile apps to people that need to have apps built, right? So rather than being so like I'm an iPhone developer, it's like hey, I build apps and who can I help, right? And moved into Internet of Things and, and built a whole community around IoT and now really more focused on machine learning and AI. And it's been interesting when the pandemic hit, I'm just sort of lamenting here, right? I mean, we were always meeting in person. It was always very Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul area focused. And so that was the community that was engaged with us. And the pandemic forced us to lose some of that, I think, personality in some ways with regards to we're from Minnesota, we're all from Minnesota, you know, we're all in the community here. And it's been a little bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, number one is I probably wouldn't have met you being over in uh, the UK right now and us doing this. I mean, these podcasts have allowed me just to expand beyond just the Twin Cities area, but there's been a little bit of a cost to that, right? So our, our meetups are really not, I feel like, as personal as they used to be. We used to always get together and have pizza and beer and kind of all be together in the same room with that human aspect to it, right? I don't know, I'm just sort of like lamenting, but it's been interesting what I've seen. And I guess I'd be curious to see if that's kind of touches on what you're seeing as well. Yeah, I mean, it's hard It's hard to say because um, I was looking at different communities that are now like not in 
the city I live in. But for me, like Brooklyn JS was like a core part of my life. And I was introduced to it by my coworkers at Watson. We would go once a month, Thursday after work to Brooklyn JS. Wednesdays, I think was like Manhattan JS. And then like Tuesdays was like Queens JS. And they were all staggered throughout the month. So like the first week of the month, it's like Manhattan JS. And then like the next week is Queens. And then like the third week is Brooklyn JS. And that was like a community that meant so much to me. And I was living in Europe around the time of the pandemic and I was just sort of seeing what was going on. And obviously all the spaces shut down, but then the bar that that Brooklyn JS was held in was sold and is empty now. And, you know, it does seem like for a lot of communities, these physical spaces that were really important, some of them have sort of switched online. The conferences seem to be coming back. Like Nordic JS, I know this year is back in person, which is great. But, you know, it, it is like a real blow because knowing that you can physically sort of go somewhere and, and interact with someone and it's, it's people in your physical community it is a different experience perhaps than being online and not, and not to say like different, better because online is as real as offline, but in the sense of like, you know, it is nice to know who's around you in your city. I grew up in, in New Orleans, which is, you know, a smaller mid-sized city with like a somewhat burgeoning now tech scene. And I go back there pretty frequently. And, you know, I always want to meet more tech people. It's nice to sort of know, or it's nice to have camaraderie and be able to talk about things. Like when I first moved here to London, I got introduced to other women technologists who went to Brooklyn JS. And that was really great because we had this like shared experience. And also it's just sometimes nice to be able to talk, to have friends that you can also then be like, oh, and then this thing happened with this product we were building. They're like, oh my gosh, yes, tell me about it. Versus trying to explain that to some other people. You're just, they're like, what are you talking about? How did it break? What do you mean? <laughs> and you're just yeah, like, right, right. I guess this is all to say like TLDR, I, I agree with you, like community. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, you, you mentioned about conferences coming back. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited. And in two weeks, I'll be flying to San Francisco to go to a, a machine learning conference, um, specifically on tiny ML. So kind of doing machine learning at the edge. And yeah, it'll be the first conference I've gone to in many, many years now. And I'm super excited for it. There are obviously ones going on in the Twin Cities that are local. I'm actually speaking at one in May, but you know, to actually physically get on a plane and fly somewhere for a quote unquote conference, it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see people, especially because you know I've been doing them online. I, I will say, but it's so easy to get distracted. And again, I'm kind of going down a little bit of a tangent here. It's not really related to AI and ML per se, but you know, it, when you fly somewhere and you go somewhere and you get a hotel and you get all that stuff and you're there it's just so much more engaging because there's like nothing else to do. Whereas right. if it's like, oh, I'm just going to pop into the Zoom call, it's so easy just to get distracted and not actually learn anything. Totally. I mean, I, I went to my my first conference post the pandemic in November. It was a data and art conference. And I actually ran into like one of my old professors there, which was really nice. But I, I was just struck by like what it felt like to like meet strangers again or like run into people I'd seen on Twitter and be like, oh my gosh, like, the feeling of physical events, but I also hope that like some hybridity sticks because there are some events that I'm prior to the pandemic, I was traveling all the time because the, you know, the technology research I do is in the human rights space. I also then work with companies, either guiding them on, on all different kinds of consulting related to either like trust and safety, ethical tech, et cetera. But I traveled a lot for work and then I would travel a lot for conferences and I don't know if I can like do that amount of traveling anymore. You know, like I've fallen out of it so much now. On one hand, I am glad that like we're sort of entering a, a time as a society where we don't have to be in person, right? And so it is nice that some things are in person, but I'm also glad like there are so many convenings I was at that were like these private convenings and people were like, they have to be in person for two days. We're going to fly everyone into this crazy location. They're going to be jet lagged and we're going to do it. And it's like, well, we don't have to. Maybe that really could have been a Zoom call. And I hope that some of those things at least stay. I agree. It's definitely more accepted, you know, now these days for sure. Because we've been forced to do it and it's worked, right? So it's like, you know, we, we all had to do it and found out we were still very productive. You mentioned about some of the projects. I, I was curious about the feminist data set. I mean, that seems like one that you've been doing for the past five years or so, and it's still working up to the present time. Could you touch on that a little bit? Sure. So Feminist Data Set is me, I guess, taking almost like a handmade approach to technology because I'm investigating every step of the machine learning pipeline from start to finish. 
using intersectional feminism as an investigatory framework. So what that means is I'm sort of deeply looking at sort of like every step and saying every sort of core component or every component of this, is it feminist? Is it not? And how would it need to be remade? So with data collection, for example, that was translated into a series of workshops where I sort of explain what is machine learning, what is data, and then participants sort of go out and look for intersectional feminist data. And it's all in text form. So that doesn't have to be an essay on intersectional feminism, but it has to be something written with intersectionality imbued within it. Meaning that like the actual textual structure has forms of intersectionality in it. And I do explain that to people that those are two different things. You, you need a workshop to do that. And so one of the examples is, you know, if someone submitted an article on wage inequality, and the article said like men and women are paid different amounts. That is not intersectionally feminist and it cannot be in the data set, even though like wage inequality is a feminist issue. But an article that sort of mentioned that people are paid different amounts. So like black women, like Latina women, like trans people, like white women, you know, indigenous women are all paid different amounts. That is an intersectional feminist article. So I'm interested in is intersectionality within text and what does that textual structure look like and i'm interested in other people also submitting this because i don't necessarily want this to be just a me project but also i feel like again sort of if i'm thinking of what is data collection itself what is intersectional data collection i think it needs to be done sort of slowly and thoughtfully with the input of others with the input of the community and sort of i see then that process you know, standing directly against the ways in which we think of data collection or data generation now, which is often this very, very fast thing. At times, it's maybe not very intentional. So I'm interested again in this sort of slowness. So that's the first step. And the second step has then been thinking about data training and data labeling and the labor behind cleaning a data set. Um, that's the thing I took for the fellowship of the Mozilla Foundation. And the third step um, is now thinking of generating the model and algorithmic audits. And those are things that I'm currently looking for funding for to do. And the reason the project ends up being so long is it's really hard to apply for arts funding because this is an art project. And when it's for something like this kind of technology research, and one of the reasons I sort of stay an art project is I'm really interested in failure. Like the model that I'll be generating is going to be extraordinarily misshapen because our text sources are coming from so many different places. It's articles, it's poems, it's like song lyrics, it's transcripts of conversations. And so the model itself actually won't be very useful to anyone but me. But also if we're thinking of this in a more traditional like HCI or computer science angle, one of the things we'd be deeply concerned about, right, is sort of the structure and performance of this model. And for me, that's almost one of the afterthoughts. I'm much more interested in the entire process of building and actually saying, well, how do you make feminist technology? And really sort of asking that at, at every step of this sort of creation process. And so I often like to say like this project is a lot about failure and friction and imperfection, right? And also it's, it's like a handcrafted project, right? Like it's like making, trying to imagine making all this, you know, from scratch. Sure. Well, I, I was looking at it on, on the website. There's an open source toolkit that you can download, right? With essays from the feminist data set. So you're, you're really doing this in the public. You know, it's very, very open. Yeah, I mean, the whole project. So there's a related project to it called TRK. So we made a web browser tool for anyone to sort of do their own data set labeling. And it was me also as a design researcher rethinking uh, microservice projects and microservice tasks. And so um, there's a wage calculator in there to sort of help people think about, well, what is this labor? And so this was, th this was the project for the Mozilla Foundation. I initially really wanted to host payments on this website. And I realized if I did that, I'm very quickly turning into a startup and I don't have the money to process people's payments via Stripe. What I could do is I could sort of show the idea of this sort of hidden labor and how we think about labor. So one of the, the big things I was thinking a lot about is how do you sort of break down the cost and idea of labor? And how do you relate that to these really small microservice tasks that we see on things like Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower? You know, as you know, part of the sort of backbone of machine learning of like where data sets can be sort of cleaned and labeled and or along with models like refined and trained. 
And the thing I realized is from doing like some user interviews with different research labs, different, even microservice workers themselves, like I became a Turker for an entire month, but just, you know, talking to people also worked in startups is we're often looking at these tasks very alone. So like, we're like saying, oh, like the task at this price is like a fair one. And then I was like, wait, but when you think about it in terms of someone's entire day and how long it takes because how do we know if this is a fair price if we don't know how much money someone is making and how long it takes? So that's where the wage calculator came from. That was sort of my intervention with the payments was actually saying people should should work an eight hour day. They shouldn't have to work more. How do we break this down and think about this more? The calculator only really works right now for the Washington state. The reason behind that is I did a lot of research into where do the majority of mechanical turkers come from? It's India and the United States, according to um, some research that I found on a peer-reviewed paper. I then decided to go with the U.S. because there was a higher cost of living. And then it turns out that the state with like the highest minimum wage is Washington State. And I was like, well, that's really poetic because that's where Amazon is headquartered. So then I looked at, at the difference between like the highest minimum, like the minimum wage and the cost of living in Seattle. And the difference was like about $9 or $8. So like the minimum wage is 11. And the cost of living needed is like, maybe it's less, maybe it's like 16. So then I crafted an entire day. I used some best practices from when I worked remote. So I wanted to give people five minute breaks at the top of every hour for a bio break that's paid for. Because when you're a microservice worker or a gig economy worker, you're not paid for your breaks. You should have a lunch break. So they get a 45 minute lunch break. So an eight hour day suddenly becomes a six and a half hour day. And then I did a series of experiments on time of how long it would take to sort of do these different tasks. And it seemed like people had an idea that microservice tasks are a few seconds long. Even doing some basic image labeling is not a few seconds. It can be like 20 seconds to a minute, depending upon what you need. So all of that went into the calculator. And effectively what I came away with is you know, there are these little sliders. I hope people will see this, look at it. There are these little sliders. So if you put something below 20 seconds, it tells you that's kind of an impossible task, like, because it should take longer because nothing really a few seconds. And then if you put it below 11 cents, that's not a living wage. Like that's the minimum. Like so with those two minimums, that's where you start to get towards this living wage. And then you can sort of add the amount of things you'd want someone to label, right? Or to sort through. And then that gives you a breakdown of how many hours or days it would take someone and like what their daily payment is. And the goal we're aiming for is this like living wage payment. And I think the day rate comes out to like, oh, I want to say like $120 a day. So the goal was to show people through this calculator, through this visualization, what it actually meant. And then what people can also do is you can also just use our tool to label a data set and it's open source. So you can use our code so you can run your own instance of it in any way you want. A few research labs have. If you're the creator of the project, we, we ask you a bunch of different questions and then you have to describe the project. So the person that's then going to be labeling like knows what it is they're looking at actually. And that was also me thinking a lot about the lack of consent and a lot of these microservice jobs people do, like not really quite knowing exactly what it is you're looking at. There's kind of a description and then that you could refuse to do it. But if I were running my own startup on this, there was a lot of things I would change. Sure. But yeah, you're, you're always constantly finding funding. I will say that, you know, one of the things that I think is really awesome about your projects is there's that visual aspect to it, right? You, you always... I just think the work that you do just really pops. It just looks really, really nice. And, and so that's needed, I think, when you try and describe data. It just can't just be a bunch of numbers you know, on the screen. So I just think your projects are amazing, Caroline. They look really, really cool. And I'm really glad that you have that artistic talent to, to sort of bring it out. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of humanizing data. I'm a big fan of, of Georgia Lupe. And that's one of, that's her, one of her theories is data humanism. I'm a big fan of, Data Feminism by uh, Klein and Ignacio. But I think the thing I'm most interested in is legibility. And I think that that does come down to design. And so a way I'm interested in legibility and impact. And I think a way to sort of get my point across more quickly is to sort of leverage all of these design and art skills that I have to show people what I'm talking about. 
So some people are like, tell us, don't show us. I'm like, no, I'm just going to show you. And sometimes that's the best way to do it is just to like show you exactly what it is or build a little experiment you can play with. And that's like at the core of a lot of my work. Sure. Well, one of the questions I like to ask people is like, yeah, what's what's sort of a day in the life of a person in your role these days? Oh, I just I think it depends on like what day. Because I run my own like little lab and we're a consultancy and research lab and a design lab. So again, if anyone if anyone's interested in like ethical tech or you like the way my brain works, please reach out to us. We're always looking for people to work with. But I'm also a part-time lecturer at the London College of Communication. In the data visualization master's program where I teach critical research. I also do a lot of fellowships. I also do art. So it really just depends on the day of the week. Like I just wrapped up a fellowship with my friend Anna Riddler. We decided to collaborate on like a one-time project for Ars Electronica's AI lab. So Anna is a really fantastic AI artist. She makes a lot of really beautiful GANs and makes her own data sets. And so we collaborated in making um, sort of a handmade data set about cypress trees in Louisiana. So I photographed over like 3,000 cypress trees. We made this scan video responding to Hurricane Ida data. It's on my website, but it's going to go up soon. So, you know, that was a really sort of beautiful experiment. That was us really kind of reflecting on the environmental impact of technology and also just, you know, eco grief and climate grief of right now. And thinking again of you know, these sort of amazing tools we can use with technology. They're new paintbrushes in a way. And how we can sort of also think of a data set as this very visual thing and as this very visceral thing. That's one of the things I really like to do is I want to sort of show that the heft of data in a way that it's very real. And yes, that was that was something really exciting to work with her on. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Well, good. Sounds like, yeah, you've got your fingers in a lot of different things probably go deep on certain things for a, a period of time and then come back up for air as these projects maybe slow down or wrap up. But yeah, it's a very, very exciting and fun fun space to be in. Just as we get kind of close to the end here, are there any sort of uh, books or conferences or, I mean, maybe we touched on some of those, but I mean, if somebody was just getting started in this space, the, you know, these days, if you were to rewind back the clock so many years, maybe what's some advice you would give to somebody as, as they're starting to work in this space? Sure, I mean... One of the conferences that was really influential for me is a conference actually in Minneapolis called IO. So E-Y-E-O. You know, Jared Thorpe was, was my professor in grad school. He was, he was the guy I mentioned earlier I ran into at, at this conference, my first physical, physical conference back. And he really changed the way I thought about data and the way I thought about technology. And then what I like about IO is there is a lot of stuff on machine learning there, which is great. And like they've had Gene Kogan speak quite a few times, Hannah Davis, and those are like two favorites of mine. I think for me, I always want to remind people that we're dealing with humans. So any data set, even if it's extraordinarily mechanical, even if it's the performance of two computers that are just sending, I don't know, packets back and forth to each other, that's still a form of human data because someone at some point made a decision that that data set needs to be created, right? Even if it's in a purely mechanical way. And so one of the things I want us to sort of think about is this data is very, we, sh- we should rethink almost the worth of it. Like it's not so disposable. And so how do we sort of shift the ways in which we think about data creation and data maintenance? How can we think of ourselves as data stewards, especially in the space of machine learning and artificial intelligence? One thing I like to remind people in particular with social media is like, you know, every data point we see about harm online is like a real person's traumatic experience. So again, how do we like How do we shift the ways in which we think of data sets as these much more embodied things, as these things that are actually priceless, right? And they're not worthless and they're not disposable. So how do we shift that understanding more and sort of remember that we're dealing with people and we're dealing with byproducts of people. And so for me, I I think of that as being like a steward. And so I wonder if we need a kind of almost like oath as technology workers that work so much with data because we need so much of it in machine learning, right, to make anything do anything. But how can we really remember kind of that importance? And so for me, that's one of the advices I I would give people is really thinking about this. And then in terms of like practical skills, IO, again, was super eye-opening to me. (laughs) All their conference talks are published online too, like a few months after the conference, you can watch them. But for me, it really helped sort of shift and change the way I thought of technology 
And I, it's very creative. And I think even to someone who thinks that they're not creative, like you, you are, you can be, and you are a creative person. If you're interested in thinking of the future possibilities of technology, this is a really great space to look at. Yeah, for sure. I missed IO last year. It sold out nearly, you know, right away. I did get a ticket this year though. So I'm going and it's going to be at the, the Walker Art Institute here this, this year. So I'll be going in June. It'll be awesome. So yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up and I will make sure to put a link to it if there's even tickets still available now. But they just went on sale a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully they're, they're still there. You know, I'm curious, are you looking at, at NFTs, you know, at all? A little bit. Okay. There's a research project I've been wanting to do about AI that also sort of relates to NFTs. And some of it is, I've been thinking a lot about the environmental impact of all the things we use in technology and my own environmental impact. I would say like, I'm very like, I'm trying to be like environmentally conscious, but I'm also like not the best. Like, I don't, what's it like? I, I don't like, oh, what's the word? It's where you like collect all of your scraps and you like put, put them, them in a compost. Yeah, I don't compost because I, I live in, I live in a building where you can't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I am really interested in some of these deeper conversations around what are the like longer, more longer term effects of our own footprints. And, you know, I'm one who like me monitoring how much I binge watch Netflix is not going to necessarily change the environmental impact of the world because, you know, it's related to so many bigger systems or much bigger companies probably need to monitor more than I do. But this is all to say, like, I've thought a lot about NFTs. And I have a lot of like sort of complex thoughts about them on one hand because of their impact. But then on the other hand, like it's enabled a lot of people to make a lot of money and it's enabled a lot of artists who normally don't make a lot of money. You know, that's an interesting thing for sure. Yeah, I was just thinking about just the, the, the monetization of data that we create ourselves, right? And that's kind of where my head was headed towards. And you know, people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and you should definitely spend a bunch of time on it and other people are naysayers. So I think the jury's really out with regards to where it's going to fit, but it has done some good with regards to putting a price on artistic output, I guess, artistic energy. I'm kind of like in the middle, like I'm glad that artists can make money. I don't think that NFTs are necessarily like revolutionary. I think they're more like evolutionary because we've had tech art for so many decades, for so many years. You know, I don't think they're really disrupting the art market because people have always bought art and art markets make a lot of money. This is just, you know, like a digitized market. I think some of the issues I have with NFTs is that there are so many markets that have almost, it seems like no real trust and safety teams or no real ways to sort of ensure quality. So like people's artwork is getting stolen and placed onto NFTs. And because it's blockchain, it's really hard to like then remove that or take that down. And that's where I think like, quality control really needs to be introduced into a lot of these platforms in a much more like thoughtful way. And it seems like a lot of these new platforms maybe aren't really doing that, which is problematic because I wouldn't want someone to take my work without my consent and put it on one of these marketplaces and then make money off my work. Like I would not really like that. Would not be nice, right? Yeah, no, no. And you, you. I mean, you kind of brought it full circle to what we were talking about with regards to harm and uh, you know the whole sort of social side of technology for sure. So, wow, this is an interesting space that you're working in. Is there anything else you wanted to share that maybe I didn't I didn't talk about? No, this was great. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. And I guess how should people find you? Is it just go to carolinesinters.com? Is that the best way? Yeah, I like go by my name on the internet. So I don't have any clever handle. It's just Caroline Cinders. So if you're looking for me, that's where I'm at across most platforms. Excellent. Okay, well, cool. Like I say, I'll be sure and put links to your website and all the projects that you've been working on in the liner notes for this podcast. And again, I appreciate your time. Very, very insightful, Caroline. And uh, thank you again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.